Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brittany Bacon, and I'm a partner with the Global Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice at Hunton Andrews Kurth. I am really delighted to welcome you all to today's webinar on machine learning hot topics, um, specifically negotiating global data protection and IP terms. The use of machine learning models to process proprietary data is becoming increasingly common as companies recognize the huge benefits that ML can provide. Many IT vendors are offering ML services that can generate valuable insights derived from their customers' proprietary data and know-how. And for companies that have not yet established their own ML expertise in-house, what we're seeing is that these services um, can offer significant business advantages and are being sought out through the use of IT vendors. In many of these cases, what gets interesting and a bit complex from a legal and compliance perspective is that one party may own the ML model, another party may have the business expertise, and yet another party uh, may own the data itself. In such cases, significant IP and data protection and security risks may arise. Data protection regulations, which we'll talk about more through this session, and which unfortunately differ by country and even state, dictate which types of data processing are permitted and, are, and under what conditions, as well as what agreements should be in place between the respective parties to delegate their data-related roles and responsibilities. On the other hand, to protect a business's IP, it is necessary to understand the different elements of the ML process and the different types of IP that may be available to protect such elements. During today's program, we will discuss these key issues um, from both a data protection and IP perspective specifically focusing on the drafting and negotiating of global agreements involving ML services and engaging in new ML practices. We also will touch on some diligence considerations for the vendor onboarding process in the context of those ML services. Before we begin, I'd like to address just a few administrative details. This program is being recorded and we will make the recording available after the program. For those of you who are seeking CLE credit, we'll provide a verification code during the presentation to be used to complete the forms provided to you in the confirmation email that you'll be getting after this program. And if you have any questions throughout, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. If time permits, we will address the questions at the end of our program. I'd now like to introduce our speakers for this program. Um, joining us for the next hour uh, is Tyler Madry, who is a partner in our Washington, D.C. office. Tyler is co-head of the firm's Intellectual Property Practice Group and focuses his practice on IP licensing and enforcement. Tyler has extensive experience in structuring and negotiating IP and technology provisions in M&A transactions, conducting IP and IT due diligence investigations, advising on open source software compliance, litigation of IP rights, and resolution of IP and technology contract disputes. And we, our privacy team has worked very closely over the past couple of years with Tyler, uh, specifically on high-tech transactions involving the use of AI and ML. Anna Pateraki is a senior associate on our privacy and cybersecurity team. She is resident in our Brussels office Anna's practice focuses on European and global data protection matters. She has extensive experience advising clients across a range of sectors on cutting edge privacy issues, such as online and mobile privacy, cloud computing, consumer programs, advertising, and life sciences. And if we'll go to the next slide, um, just for those of you who, who are not as familiar with us, our privacy and cybersecurity team includes nearly 50 privacy and data security professionals in the US, EU, and Asia. Our privacy clients range across many different industry sectors, um, and we are supported by our Center for Information Policy Leadership, which is a global privacy think tank that provides strategic consulting services and works with industry leaders and regulatory authorities and policymakers around the globe to develop solutions and best practices for the responsible and lawful use of data in the modern information age. 
I also encourage you to check out our blog and sign up. We update it very regularly. And we also post regularly on our Twitter handle um, at privacy, uh, Hunt and Privacy. And now I'll turn it over to Tyler to tell you about the IP team and then to move right into our session. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, this just gives a snapshot of our IP group at Hunt In. We have about 42 lawyers and some excellent paralegals and patent agents. One thing I really like about our group is the depth of experience we have across the different types of IP and practice areas, which you can see from this slide, including our litigation practice, our ITC practice, uh, our IP and technology transactions, and our extensive experience in patent and trademark prosecution. And of course, we're grateful for the recognition our group has received from the, the well-known publications at the bottom. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? So as, as Brittany mentioned, we've got an interesting program today. We're going to start out uh, talking about machine learning for a few minutes and what it, the key characteristics and the key components of it are. And then uh, the, the implementation is, and as Brittany mentioned, you know, one of the really interesting aspects we're seeing is where you've got multiple parties involved in implementing a machine learning model, you know, with the company that starts the process and the, the machine learning service provider or vendor, and then the, the customers who often provide data. Um, after that, I'll cover the, uh, the IP aspects uh, the types of IP that are relevant to covering the different elements of the machine learning system, uh, some due diligence that's useful at the beginning of the process to understand uh, the IP and technology of each party and business model and so forth, and then talk about and focus on the types of contract terms that, that we all need to be aware of as we put these agreements together. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Brittany and, and uh, Anna to talk about key data protection law considerations. And we'll wrap up with some, a summary of some practical tips uh, that, that you can keep in mind as you, as you negotiate these types of agreements. Okay, next slide, please. And the next one. Okay, so machine learning versus traditional programming. What is machine learning? Um, and obviously, I know lots of you in the audience uh, have experience with it. Um, the, in traditional programming, as you know, you've got a software engineer who's writing code that's got specific algorithms in it. Uh, and it obviously can be complex, but it, it's static in the sense that the code doesn't change. It, it's written and it operates as it's supposed to, but it doesn't change. Machine learning, the key characteristic as, is that you use data known as training data and feed that into the machine learning model. And it, it uses the training data to update its performance and to improve its performance over time. And that's the key distinction and the key advantage that machine learning provides and why it's so extensively used now. Um, so in general, the, the process, the machine learning process involves a number of steps. There's a first step of gathering and preparing data. And that's actually not trivial because you have to choose, you know, which are the data elements you want to feed into the model that are have the most predictive value. There, there are things that need to be cleaned up or normalized so that they're in the same uh, they're the same units, for example. Uh, there's labeling that goes on to attach annotations to, to label whatever data is going in that's used in, in updating the model. So it's, it's not a tri trivial exercise, but that's the first part of the process. The next is choosing the machine learning model. And, and that's, of course, not trivial either. Uh, there, there are, as you know, many, many different types of machine learning models, and some are better suited to certain types of problems than others. So there's plenty of expertise that goes into choosing whether it's a classification model or regression or supervised versus unsupervised learning, et cetera. Uh, 
Next is the training step, which is obviously key because that's where the value comes from in improving the performance, the predictive performance of the machine learning model. And I'll go through a short example in a minute. After you do that, and hopefully your model's improved its accuracy, you, you use some of your additional data to test the model to make sure that it's performing as you expect. And once that's, that step is done, then it's ready to actually make prediction based on new data that's never seen before. So that's the general steps that are typically involved in the machine learning process. Uh, just to provide one example, say you've got a machine learning system that's designed to an analyze a medical image of a tissue sample. And what you want your model to do is to predict or determine whether the tissue sh sample shows a particular disease like cancer. So that would be pretty difficult to do with a static sort of traditional program, not impossible, but to think about a programmer writing code to do that is a little bit daunting. On the other hand, if you have access to a lot of medical images, you know, some showing the disease, some not, and you've got a doc doctor or a pathologist who can label the training data, the images would be the training data, for example, indicating which ones show the disease and where the disease is located and what kind of disease it is. You can then feed that image into the machine learning model which then makes a prediction as to what it sees. And you compare that prediction to what the pathologist labeled the data as and use that. There's a, there's a cost function that you can have in these machine learning models that updates some internal parameters to make the prediction more accurate. And so you do that over and over, over time, when you adjust those parameters that control the functioning of the machine learning model, it gets better and better and more accurate at predicting what it's seeing. So ultimately, after you do that and you test it, and assuming you're successful, you can put a new image into that machine learning model. And based on all the training and the training data that it's received, it will then be able to accurately predict what it's seeing. So you can do that. And if you're successful, the output of the machine learning model will tell you that it's you know a certain type of cancer in a particular image that you that you uh, given to it. So that's just one example. Um, can you go to the next slide? So healthcare medical diagnostics is one. It's it's used in drug discovery, uh, in marketing. It's used for targeting products. You've all seen you know that type of technology from Netflix. You might also like this film. Um, suggestions that you get from Amazon. In, in banking, it, it can be used for credit risk modeling for loan applications. Uh, and in other sectors for biometrics, like fingerprints and facial recognition. I mean, there are lots of other examples. Autonomous vehicles, Siri on your iPhone, fraud detection, spam filters. There, there's just, we all have seen lots of technologies where machine learning is a key part of it. So that's why, you know, this is such a relevant topic. It's, it's, it's happening all over the place and it's, it's successful. It's not just a buzzword. It's actually working in practice. Uh, next slide, please. So as we go through and talk about legal issues, it's important to keep track of the main components of a machine learning system. It's really necessary, you know, in order to, be able to uh, understand and negotiate contracts and protect your, your company's rights. You need to know exactly what the components are. So we've talked about these, the train data is a key component because that's where the value comes from. And there's a distinction between raw data, which is not labeled and not cleaned. That's what you start with, but there's an awful lot of value also in providing the labels to the training data to selecting certain data elements that are that are successful in predicting outcomes, to normalize the data, to correct errors, et cetera. Uh, so there's, there's work and know-how that goes into that. Then there's methods of training the model. And there's certainly machine learning expertise that you would get at a machine learning vendor. That's their business, is, is knowing how these work, programming them, adapting them, training them. Uh, you know, it's a whole area 
where there's expertise that's highly valuable. But then along with that, the, the methods of training also involve, if you're the company, you have valuable know-how about the business and the technology of your business. And that's something that's used in the training uh, as well, because you're ultimately trying to make the model, you know, give you insights about your business and your products and services. And so part of the training involves that type of know-how being uh, incorporated into the model. There's the model, of course, uh, and there, as I mentioned before, there's lots of different kinds of machine learning models and there's expertise in knowing which ones apply best to certain situations. They're the parameters which are updated uh, as the model gets trained. And so they're, they're incorporated in the model and part of the model. Uh, and, but they're a key component because they represent the, the improvement of the model. And then there's the output from the model, which is kind of the whole point. If you're the company and you're engaging a machine learning vendor, you're doing it so that the, the machine learning model ultimately will tell you something you didn't know, will provide you insight that you can use as a business advantage. Uh, and so this is this slide is a way of it's a it's a summary of at least from an IP perspective, the key components of the machine learn, learning model to keep track of as you're uh, negotiating these agreements with third parties. Uh, next slide, please. And Brittany touched on this before, but this just lists uh, some of the types of parties we see more and more often when uh, there are multiple parties involved. So you, you've got, and, and I'll describe this, um, I'll describe this in terms of uh, a typical situation where you're at a company and uh, you, have your, you have customers and they may provide the training data, and uh, they may have individuals who have personal information in that training data. There may be experts like pathologists or doctors who label the training data, provide annotations, provide advice on what training data to use. Your company contributes valuable business and technical know-how in the process. And then you have the machine learning vendor who provides the machine learning model, the training expertise, and whose model generates the results and insights. So with multiple parties and IP development and a large amount of data, as Brittany mentioned, you start to see some pretty interesting IP and data protection issues that arise from this whole process. Next slide, please. And this slide shows where you at your company may have some differing objectives from the other parties. So in the first section, company versus machine learning vendor, from your perspective, you're going to want to maximize your IP ownership and control over the various elements of the machine learning system, including the input and output data. The machine learning vendor, on the other hand, is going to want to exploit as much as it can in terms of the inputs and outputs and the results. Uh, same types of considerations are are in play when you're talking about data protection. You know, you may have a close relationship with your customers and want to make sure, of course, that you're complying with all data privacy regulations and laws. The machine learning vendor, one step removed, may not be, you know, as cognizant or concerned about that, and you have to make sure that that they're compliant. And then you've got the intersection of IP and data protection, uh, where it's interesting because the data is certainly one aspect of the IP, but it's also the subject of the data protection. And just because you have rights to use data from an IP perspective doesn't mean that you can do anything with it and still comply with the data protection laws. And so that's an interesting dynamic as well to make sure that those are consistent. All right, next slide, please. And the next one. So just just quickly, um, the uh, types of IP that are relevant in this ML, ML context. So trade secrets are probably the most important. And this is just a paraphrase of the definition of trade secrets under the Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act. 
So business scientific technical information, if the owner has taken reasonable measures to keep it secret and the information derives independent economic value from not being generally known or read, readily ascertainable, um, there's a lot of a lot of data and information and know-how and algorithms that fall into this definition. The next one, proprietary information and data isn't strictly an IP right. Uh, the only IP right would be trade secrets, but I included it because there's an awful lot of information that may fall into this category that may not necessarily satisfy the legal definition of trade secret under this federal law or state statutes, but still valuable and that's protected by contract. So that's necessary to keep that in mind too. Uh, patents will cover non novel, non-obvious applications of machine learning systems and methods. Uh, there, there's a lot that goes into filing a patent, of course, and there's uncertainties about computer related inventions. And there was actually a controversy earlier this year about whether a machine learning model itself could be named as an inventor. Um, the bottom line is that there are certainly, there's a lot of activity in patenting inventions that have a, a significant or less significant machine learning component to it. And there are hurdles that you have to get over, but uh, it's certainly worth considering whether you've got a good idea that you're, that you have at your company and it's worth applying for patent protection on it. And then of course, copyrights protect software code uh, and um, as a literary work. So that's a, that's kind of a summary of the, um, the types of IP that protect the various elements in the machine learning context. All right, next slide, please. All right, so the, the next three slides are, I think in some ways the most important takeaways from an IP perspective. Um, and these relate to certain due diligence uh, that I think is extremely helpful in going into these types of contracts. And, and the, the bottom line is that if you can spend some time up front and learn the technology and the IP that each party is bringing to the table, and secondly, learn and understand the type of IP and, and technology that will be developed in the relationship. And third, understand the business model uh, in terms of how each party is going to make money. Those types of facts make the drafting of the contract much, much easier. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to negotiate IP terms in the abstract. Um, and I've seen that numerous times where parties try to start doing that without really knowing what's going on in detail. And so these, these three slides, I think, are, are sort of the, the best way to, to deal with that situation and to help your side. So in this one, um, you know, machine learning obviously means something's going to be developed because something's being learned. Uh, and so I find it very helpful to understand each party's pre-existing technology and IP. What, what's the training data that's going to be brought to the table? Who owns it? What are the key data elements, configuration, and labels? Who's providing that? What industry know-how is going to be used to train the model? Uh, those two are probably at your company. Um, the machine le learning model configuration and source code, if you're using a machine learning vendor, they're going to they're going to look at that as their crown jewels, their secret sauce. And then the machine learning model trading expertise, same thing. That's their bread and butter. That's how they make their money. And so they keep, they consider that to be very important. Um, in the bottom half of this slide is, I think, a, a, a very important thing to keep in mind is protect your IP before you get into the relationship. So identify your valuable know-how and trade secrets. And that sounds like kind of a trivial step, but I think it's very important because, you know, you can have a, a casual conversation and get a, a small amount of information about that. And sometimes your company will take it for granted, like everyone knows this, but there's potentially some very important trade secrets, know-how, business experience that uh, you need to identify and keep secret and, and maybe not uh, you know, not commit to providing to the other side. Uh, if you have good inventions, 
uh, it's certainly a good idea to file patent applications beforehand before you get into any discussions because then you can you know demonstrate that it was your idea not a joint idea that's not always the case i mean you have to decide whether to keep it a trade secret or a patent um, but if it's going to if it's a candidate for patent protection it's good to file that up front and then identifying software uh, this exercise is important to controlling access to unregistered ip it's easy enough to keep track of patents and trademarks that are registered it's a lot harder to identify and keep track of unregistered ip like know-how data unregistered software and that unregistered ip can be very valuable in these types of transactions Next slide, please. And then this slide goes to giving some thought to what, what are the types of IP and technology that are going to be developed in this relationship. So results and insights generated by the machine learning model. So maybe the machine learning vendor, if they, if they develop that or they produce that with their model, you know, they would potentially consider that their property, but that's the whole reason you're getting into this. If you're the other company and you want to uh, think about ownership or control of those results and insights, uh, labeled training data, there may be a lot of thought and effort and value in that. So you have to think about uh, what that's going to look like at the end and who has ownership and who has rights to use it, improve trained machine learning model and model parameters, industry specific machine learning training processes and machine learning processes themselves and then any other inventions or data the, the point is to to think about what's going to be produced and who's going to own it and who's going to have rights to use it and do that up front just to get an idea of where the where the relationship is going from an ip perspective next slide please and then finally in terms of due diligence the business model uh, it's worth spending some time at the front understanding how each party party derives revenue and profits from the collaboration so what are the what's the current and future business model product services and revenue streams and what types of customers industries and locations does the other party have this will give you insight into you know what they're going to want to do with the results of this collaboration um, the because it's based on how they're trying to make make money and, and you know run their business. And then finally, in terms of due diligence, envision any areas of potential competition with your new party. Envision the other party working with your competitor. Uh, I've seen this dynamic a few times where the if you're working with a machine learning vendor, their you know their business is providing that service and they're gonna want to be able to reuse the results to a certain extent. Uh, and if the worst case for you would be if they want to do that with your competitor and pass on all the insights that have been learned to your competitor. So you've got to keep that front and center to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and at the end of the day, you'll be able to control this with contract restrictions that you think about, you know, essentially, what are you permitted to do and not permitted to do with the results and same questions for the other party. And then finally, in addition to those contract restrictions, think about what your background IP is coming into the relationship and how you can use that to, to control access at the end. The next slide, please. Um, so this slide talks about joint development. The, the point is to try to understand early on how much joint development there's going to be. There's, of course, going to be some development because we're talking about machine learning where the, there is you know, technology being developed and insights being generated sometimes you're in a relationship where there's real joint development and the parties are working shoulder to short shoulder to improve the machine learning model and there's a lot of exchange of information on the other hand there are situations where one party is merely providing training data that may even be raw training data and the other party takes that and you know, the other party being the machine learning service provider takes that and you know uses it labels it improves their model and then provides results at the end and 
they may not want to give you much more than the results. And it's, I'm not saying that one of those situations is better than the other. It's just that you want to know which scenario you're in or something in between so that you can have you know common expectations about how much joint development is going to occur and how much information is exchange is going to occur. Right, next slide, please. So this slide relates to IP ownership. And as in most development agreements, the parties will generally keep ownership of their background IP. You want to have you want to specify ownership rights to the developed IP. Joint ownership is usually not a good option, uh, basically, because the default rules for joint owners of IP are very complicated and they vary based on the type of IP and the country. And so uh, in this scenario, it would be a very complex set of rules if you rely on default rules of joint IP ownership. So you generally want to assign developed IP to one party. A lot of times that based on subject matter, like the results and insights, if you're the company, you, you probably want to own that. The training data, same thing. And then the, the machine learning vendor is going to want to own the, the improvements that relate to the machine learning process. And then you probably want to own the industry specific inventions. So ownership is important to get right. Um, but even more important is the, the license rights because those can be tailored much more specifically. Next slide, please. And this slide just provides a summary of the key characteristics of a license grant when you get around to determining which party, what the other party is permitted to do with your IP and vice versa. So um, I wanna make sure we're not running too far over, but this, uh, this identifies, you know, is the license grant just to the licensee or also to its affiliates? Is it exclusive or non-exclusive? What type of license IP are you talking about? You can have multiple license grants if you need to customize it. Field of use restrictions may be very important if you want to prevent the vendor from uh, competing with you in your, your industry area. Permitted activities have made rights, third party access, territorial restrictions, uh, term and termination, transferability, and then payments. So this is a this is a good summary of the types of characteristics of a license grant that you would need to consider. Next slide, please. Confidentiality obligates another key contract term. As as we mentioned before, the the a lot of the value in terms of the IP is probably going to be in trade secrets. So it's important that the confidentiality obligations are very specific and strong. And you may want to rely on not just generic confidentiality provisions, but also specifically identifying the information that you consider confidential, like the business and technical know-how of your company, the training data, and the results and insights. Even though those are generated by the machine learning vendor, you may want to specify that they're the confidential information of your company. On the other hand, the machine learning vendor often is very, very guarded about the model itself and the underlying algorithms and the training methods and, and wants to make sure that those are very carefully protected because that's their bread and butter in terms of their business. Uh, sometimes you get into discussions about whether the vendors able to publish results or disclose results under a non-disclosure agreement. That's of interest to the vendor, of course, because they can show how adept they are at providing these services and the results that they get. Uh, sometimes that could be acceptable if it's a non-disclosure agreement outside of your field, but that's another issue that comes up. Uh, and, and lastly, um, just to point out that confidentiality obligations by themselves don't necessarily preclude use of the data so the other party could use your data without disclosing it and get a lot of use out of it. So it's important to keep that in mind too. Next slide. And then finally, um, explicit use restrictions uh, are important to include. So the ones that I've seen most often are the, the relating to what 
from the company's perspective, what the machine learning vendor is not permitted to do in terms of the company's background IP, developed IP training data in a defined field of use or for the benefit of company competitors. In other words, if you're the company, you want to make sure, and this is probably one of the most sensitive areas, you want to make sure that if you disclose key information in terms of your business or technology, either directly through conversations with a vendor or indirectly by providing the data to their model, that they're not able to take that and pass the value of that on to your competitors in the same field. That's a, that a pretty significant risk that you need to keep track of. And then on the other hand, the machine learning vendor is often very careful to say that you're not able to reverse engineer or decompile their code or their algorithms because that's their, their most valuable IP. And then finally, as I mentioned before, um, it's an interesting dynamic because you may negotiate IP rights that are, you know, from an IP perspective, advantageous to you, but you always have to keep in mind that the underlying data privacy and data security regulations may curtail that for you and for the vendor. And just because you've got an IP license doesn't necessarily mean that you're not, that you're compliant with the data privacy laws. So with that, let me turn it over to Anna to enlighten us on that aspect. Great, thank you so much, Tyler. We'll now discuss the key data protection considerations in connection with uh, machine learning agreements. Uh, next slide, please. From a data protection perspective, machine learning models are likely to involve various levels of risk for various reasons. First, machine learning models process personal data in many different ways and combine personal data from various sources. As we have already said in this webinar today, personal data is imported in, into various databases and become training data for new automated processes in the ML context. Using the training data, the ML model can train, test, and improve its processes to make accurate predictions and generate insights. So you should have a plan when you negotiate an agreement with an ML vendor. You will probably want to ensure a couple of things. Um, that the vendor's use of the data does not conflict with the representations you've made to your customers or other data subjects, and does not create unintended legal consequences for these individuals that the operation of the model aligns, aligns with your overall ethical approach to conducting business, and that you can modify the ML model to align it with your internal compliance programs. Also that you can allocate responsibilities considering your general business objectives and risk tolerance. Moving on to the next slide, we'll talk um, about a few key issues that should be considered at the outset of negotiating an agreement with an ML vendor. In the next couple of slides, we will be addressing contractual considerations regarding applicable law, data controllership or equivalent role, data security risks, ML risk assessments, and recommended ML specific privacy terms for use in such agreements. Next slide. So when you engage with a global vendor, it is key to draft the agreement in a way that covers all applicable data protection laws. Depending on how each law applies, you should consider things like where the parties are established or do business, what is the residency of individuals whose personal data the vendor will process, and what law should be identified in the agreement itself, for example, the GDPR, the CCPA, and others. Um, a global vendor agreement should include all contract terms required for your compliance with the different data protection laws, role, rules, and regulations in the relevant jurisdictions. For example, as you know, the GDPR um, in, in, the, in Europe applies to companies that are established in the EU, but also to companies that are not established in the EU, uh, 
which offer products and services remotely to individuals in Europe or monitor their behavior. Therefore, if the GDPR applies to your data processing activities and these processing activities are carried out by an ML vendor on your behalf, you should ensure that a global agreement with such vendor includes GDPR terms and more among other applicable terms. And there are certainly different ways of drafting global agreements, but it will be possible in most cases to address the applicable data protection terms in a single document rather than using localized versions. Um, before we move to the next slide, I want to turn to my colleague, Brittany, who has some thoughts to add on the applicable law issues um, for global agreements. Thanks, Anna. You know, just as a very threshold matter, from a data protection and applicable law perspective, one of the key issues to resolve is, is the data at issue, whether it's in the training data or whether it's in the results and insights that are derived from the, the use of the training data, does that actually constitute personal information pursuant to the relevant laws? And the challenge, as we have certainly seen, we've, we've always seen this in, in Europe where the definition of personal data is very broadly defined to include any information relating to an identified or identifiable individual. We've now seen through the emergence of laws in the US like the CCPA and the, the amending uh, California Privacy Rights Act, the CPRA, an equally, if not more broad um, interpretation of the definition of personal information to include things like dev device identifiers and IP addresses and cookie information, cookie level information and data that includes inferences that are drawn from this personal information data elements. So, you know, key thing to keep in mind is it's, it's not just data that is directly identifiable and includes things like names, et cetera, that matters and that needs to be protected and considered. It's this, it's this broader scope of data, um, recognizing that it's increasingly difficult to meet the standard of anonymized or de-identified data as, as that term may be used in relevant uh, applicable laws. Turning it back over to Anna now. Great, thank you so much, Brittany. Moving on to the next slide, we'll talk about uh, the data controllership issue. As you know, data protection laws around the world dictate which agreements should be executed between the parties to allocate their data protection roles and responsibilities. And actually, the type of agreement largely depends on the roles of the parties. Now, in the ML context, the roles of the parties are not always very clear, especially where the multiple parties involved in applying an ML model um, to a particular problem or opportunity use a, a complex structures. However, for contract purposes, the parties will need to establish the obligations and liabilities to which each party is subject. Laws like the GDPR include different responsibilities for data controllers and data processors. And so the GDPR requires that a controller imposes specific terms on a data processor. Such GDPR processor terms focus largely on restricting the processor's use of the data, ensuring cooperation with the data controller, imposing data security audit and sub-processing requirements, and ultimately requiring the processor to delete or return the data to the controller at the end of the process. So there are also other contract requirements for joint controllers under the GDPR where two or more parties co-determine purposes and means of processing. And this is typically a very fact sensitive analysis. So with all these complexities in mind, from a negotiation perspective of a global agreement, it is essential to determine at the outset if the ML vendor is a processor or a controller um, so as to determine which type of agreement will be required in a given case. A determining factor, as we will say in more detail later, will be to consider whether the ML vendor is seeking to use the data it received from customers for its own purposes. 
But let's move on to the next slide and look at the controllership uh, issue in a bit more detail. Um, so taking a step back, from a GDPR perspective, again, a data controller is the entity that determines the purposes, uh, both the purposes and means of the data processing and uses the data for its own purposes. It is the entity that takes decisions about the data processing, including deciding whether to delegate um, the processing to a vendor, for example. And determining the purposes of the processing really requires autonomy to make decisions regarding the processing, like deciding which data elements will be collected, um, if you can change the processing, decide where the data will be stored for how long, et cetera. And then determining the means, it's more technical and involves deciding on the technical and organizational means that will be used to achieve the purpose of the processing, including sometimes which service providers will have access to the data. On the other hand, a data processor is the entity that only processes data on behalf and under the instructions of the controller and is not authorized to use the data for its own purposes. Um, in practice, a processor may determine the means of the processing, like how to process the data, which security measures apply, as long as it does not determine the ultimate purposes, um, which remain, remains and should remain the responsibility of the controller. Again, there are some complexities in these roles. And while these roles may be straightforward in certain business relationships, these ro roles are less clear in the machine learning context. There may be challenges so to determine whether an ML vendor is a processor or uses the data for its own purposes, um, and that it would be a controller or a joint controller, depending on the facts. Um, and, and sometimes even those roles can, can vary per type of data processing activities if the vendor is offering you a variety of such activities. And there is no a one fit all solution, but a key element to consider in a relevant contract negotiation is whether the ML vendor really seeks to derive value from the ML process um, that uses for your data. However, once it is established that the ML vendor is a processor, you will need to ensure that the vendor does not act outside of its role and your instructions and uses the data for activities and does not use the data for activities that are of, of, of its own um, purposes. Um, so in summary, in establishing the roles of the parties in, in the ML contact, there are a few key issues to consider. Who develops the model and who uses it? Who crunches the data for analysis and exploration? Who updates or improves the model? And last but not least, does the vendor have access to the data uh, for its own purpose, such as to enhance its offering for other customers? Another issue to consider um, is data transfer considerations given the Schrems II ruling um, of last summer in Europe, um, which may require some additional contract um, terms or technical terms to be imposed on the vendor. But this issue is no different in the ML context. Uh, so we will not go into detail in this webinar. Um, before we move to, to the next slide, Brittany is going to speak about the roles of the parties, also from a US perspective. Thanks, Anna. So, so very quickly, because um, this slide is, is pretty focused on the EU terminology of data processor and data controllers, we have a similar construct now in the United States, thanks to the CCPA and CPRA. Um, data controller is, is equated in some ways to a business under the CCPA, data processor equated to a service provider. Um, in addition, there's terms now called contractors and third parties third parties being entities that are not service providers, which may be able to use the data for their own purposes um, and, and which are not the primary business. I, I think this is one of the areas that is the most complex um, in the ML space when we're trying to assess data protection um, implications and considerations. And it's where the law has not quite fully caught up to the technology. Um, there is not a black and white distinction between the business owner and the ML vendor who inevitably and understandably wants to use the data that it receives 
from the business to train its own technology, which in the case of like a SaaS solution may be of course used um, for products offered to other customers. Um, so where to draw the line is, is requires some certain creativity and thoughtfulness in drafting. It's something that we've worked very closely with Tyler and his team on um, to try, try to draw those lines and, and keep the concepts of IP ownership, like data ownership and license to use, not inconsistent with the data protection concepts of business, service provider, third party, data controller, data processor. With that, let's move on to the next slide. Managing security risks. So very, very to touch on this um, because we've been focusing pretty heavily on privacy and, and data protection per se, but security is uh, not surprisingly an issue as well uh, to the extent an, a, an ML model does involve the use of personal information, again, as, as broadly defined under applicable laws. Um, the laws both in Europe and, and the US and, and beyond are not incredibly prescriptive when it comes to what has to be undertaken to safeguard personal information. Most of the requirements talk about reasonable safeguards that are designed to help ensure the confidentiality and protection of the relevant personal information. Um, a business owner who's engaging with an ML vendor should be understanding from the vendor, and this, this happens early on with the diligence phase, what standards for data security the vendor is utilizing in the AI system, what measures are being taken to mitigate security risks and can have the designers, um, how have the designers tried to mitigate malicious actions that can be taken against their AI systems. Um, uh, you know, on a, a note on breach notification, this of course is not specific or special to ML contracts. We see this in all data processing contracts that involve uh, personal information and that is to impose on a vendor the obligation to notify the quote unquote data owner um, or the business or the data controller in the event of a breach. Again, given the murky waters and the intersection of IP and data protection where we may be establishing data ownership under IP a certain way and defining it a certain way, that can have implications on who has the obligation to notify affected individuals and regulators in the event of a breach. Traditionally, in the US, for example, that obligation lies with the data owner, as defined under, under breach laws, um, and the, the service provider is simply required to notify such entity. So again, being mindful of, of making sure it's clear in, an, in a relevant contract who has the responsibility to notify in the event of a breach, who will have the responsibility to notify affected individuals and regulators, and in terms of risk shifting, who's going to pay, which of course is, is an important question. Moving on to the next slide. Risk assessments. Um, increasingly, we are seeing an expectation to implement um, risk assessments as a key accountability element in any comprehensive privacy program that involves the processing of data. ML is no exception. And this slide applies not only to business owners um, who are gonna benefit from the ML model, but also the ML vendors who have been engaged by the business owners. And we'd wanna make sure that the vendor agreement in some form or another requires the vendor to regularly conduct risk assessments um, to ensure that they have appropriately uh, you know, ad addressed those risks. Um, organizations as a whole are, it should be adopting a risk-based approach when they're evaluating AI systems. The, the key is to make sure that data protection risks at an early stage are identified and mitigated um, and that you know, any trade-offs, and there's gonna always be trade-offs, especially in the ML context, any trade-offs between different risks are clearly documented, are assessed, and it's understood what those competing interests are and how the business or the ML vendor is identifying and assessing those trade-offs and mitigating them to the extent possible. Next slide, please. So uh, to try to, to capture as best we could some of the key privacy and security terms that we would recommend embedding into an ML vendor contract, um, you know, some of the challenge of course is by, by their nature, ML models um, owned by ML vendors may involve proprietary information. So in some cases, it can be very difficult to get information from a vendor 
about the nuts and bolts, about how it does what it does, about how the algorithms are designed, how the data is actually used and transformed and processed, which can leave a business in a position where they're, they're vulnerable, they're exposed. Um, so I think the key is, in addition to trying to get to the bottom of this from a factual perspective and conducting appropriate diligence, which Anna will touch on in a, in a moment, ensuring that you have appropriate contractual provisions that contemplate the key policies, procedures, and processes that mitigate the risk and, and establish a framework through which an ML vendor processes personal data in the context of its ML models. So provisions may include ones that ensure fairness and prevent unwanted bias, um, agreement on uh, regular updates and reviews for accuracy of the ML model, guarding against changing population and concept drifts, using privacy enhancing technologies like de-identification, anonymization, obfuscation, encryption, um, not keeping data for any longer than is needed to, to fulfill the purposes for which it was, it was collected requiring appropriate safeguards from a security perspective. And as we talked about breach notification requirements, employing ethics by design. Again, I think this is an area that makes ML quite unique um, in that it's not just about legal requirements that we need to consider, but also what is the right thing to do? And, and the ethics question is something both business owners and ML vendors have to keep top of mind ensure appropriate leadership and supervision. We need oversight in the ML process, which again, helps ensure preventing unwanted bias, ensuring fairness, et cetera. Um, ongoing monitoring and audits and evaluation and training, risk assessments, and finally, um, more ML specific risk mitigating measures, which include embedding human review into data outputs and maintaining appropriate documentation. Next slide. And now Anna is going to quickly talk about due diligence to, uh, to wrap our, our presentation up. Thanks very much, Brittany. Um, so while it is important to draft appropriate data protection terms in the agreements with the mail vendors, it is also important to perform due diligence before onboarding the vendor. And as part of your regular vendor onboarding process, you should consider inquiring about the ML vendor's general privacy compliance posture, but also in respect of the um, ML model. And if they're doing, for example, ML risk assessments, inquire about the vendor's risk mitigation measures um, and things like pseudonymization encryption are things you would want to know if they use. Last but not least, you will want to have the vendor complete your vendor diligence questionnaires. And I'll move on to the next slide and give you just a couple of examples of questions that you may want to consider asking your ML vendor in your diligence questionnaires. Um, I will not read all of them, but go through a couple of important points. Like you could consider asking the vendor how does the model balance accuracy with data minimization? As you know, this is an, an essential trade-off that needs to be made or has to be made in practice in many ML applications. Um, then you could ask about automatic decision-making. Is the model leading to determinative decisions? Um, does it allow for human review of the output? Is the model fair? And how will my data subjects be protected against unwanted bias or potential discrimination? Do you conduct risk assessments? How will I be able to respond to data subject requests? Will the model desi design allow extraction of the relevant data? And then ultimately, do you derive data from my customer data or reuse the output for benefit of other customers? These are questions that you will want to know at the beginning. And similar questions may be included in your standard vendor onboarding process, but it's worth tailoring some of them um, specifically for your ML applications. Moving forward towards the end of the, of, of the presentation, we have listed here just a couple of additional resources for further reading if you're interested. Um, on data protection and AI guidance more broadly from the FTC, the European Commission, also the um, ICO Data Protection Authority in the UK, um, 
there are interesting AI procurement materials issued from the UK government and the World Economic Forum, um, which um, have been issued for the public sector, but they do include general principles that are very um, useful for the private sector as well. I also want to mention our article, Brittany Taylor and I co-authored an article on training machine learning model using customer proprietary data. Um, and a few uh, resources additional from our Center of, for Information Policy Leadership, importantly, how the GDPR regulates AI. It's an important resource I encourage you to read. Um, with that, I'll turn back to Tyler and Brittany to summarize our conclusions from today's program. Thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, so this is just a recap of what we talked about before. Again, from the IP perspective, I think it's very important to roll up your sleeves and, and get the technical details about the technology and the IP that's coming into the relationship and that'll be developed in each component of the machine learning system. In addition to understanding the business model and how your partner is going to make money and how you're going to make money, identifying and protecting your IP rights with the various types of IP, uh, both before the relationship starts and uh, in the contract uh, in anticipation of what's going to be created, which entails specifying IP ownership licenses, use restrictions and confidentiality obligations. And then finally, making sure as, as Anna and Brittany have mentioned as well, that the, the use rights under IP perspective are consistent with the data protection and data privacy uh, regulations and laws. Just from a data protection perspective, um, conduct upfront due diligence, use the amazing questions that Anna had on that prior slide, identify the role of each party. This is probably the most challenging piece. Consider the minimum contractual responsibilities that will be binding the, the ML vendor to with respect to their data processing activities. And then consider the additional ML specific contractual terms to further mitigate risk. It's not just about using your standard vendor privacy and security template. Um, there are some key uh, unique issues to address. And then finally, consider key uh, jurisdictional considerations and data transfer issues, which we did not even have time to get into for this, this session. But thank you all again so much for joining us. Feel free to reach out to any one of us for any questions you may have. Uh, we apologize we weren't able to get to the questions asked in the Q&A uh, chat session, but uh, very much appreciate that and look forward to speaking with you all soon. Take care.